In this video, we discuss the first translation theorem, also known as the first shifting theorem. I'm going to state a theorem for you. Then we will derive it. The derivation is actually pretty simple. And then we'll compute the Laplace transform of a function using the theorem, and we'll compute the inverse Laplace transform of a function using the theorem. Now, if you're wondering why would I ever have to use this theorem, um, this is why. If you have e to the a t times f of t, and you know the Laplace transform of f of t, this theorem can be used to find that transform. Now, if you already have e to the a t times f of t in your table of Laplace transforms, there's no need for this theorem. But if you don't, if f of t is somewhat complicated and we don't have e to the a t times f of t in the table, then it would be appropriate to use this theorem. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, let's um, do the derivation now. First, I'll state the theorem. It says, if f has a Laplace transform f of s um, for all s greater than c, um, where c is greater than or equal to zero, and a is some constant, then the Laplace transform of e to the a t times f of t is equal to f of s minus a. Now, if you're wondering what that is, remember this is the Laplace transform of f. but then we're replacing the S with S minus A. So that's nice. We call this the first translation theorem or the first shifting theorem because we are shifting the graph of F of S, A units to the right, if we were graphing F of S versus S um, in that domain um, featuring that transformation parameter S. Now let me show you how this is derived. It's actually very simple. If we're taking the Laplace transform of e to the at times f of t, by definition, oops, trying to get that to move up, there we go. By definition, that's the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times e to the a t times f of t dt. You just multiply by this function, you integrate from zero to infinity, and then you're good to go. That's gonna be the Laplace transform of this guy. But if I simplify this by just using a little bit of algebra, we've got e to some power times e to some other power, we add the exponents. So that's gonna be e to the negative st plus a t, which can be Simplified further, if we factor out the negative one and factor out the t, we get this. Well, that is identical to f of s. Remember the Laplace transform of f of t is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times f of t dt. This is exactly the same as this. The only difference is that s has been replaced by s minus a. So this is f of s evaluated at s minus a. And that's it. And you say, well, that's gonna work as long as s minus a is um, greater than c. And if you have s minus a is greater than c, you just add a to both sides and you get this inequality. Okay, um, so very simple. Um, the, the Laplace transform of e to the at times this is actually equal to this. Now in practice, the way we evaluate this is using this expression here. First we take the Laplace transform of f and then we replace the s with s minus a. Um, and then you can also do this backwards. So let's state both of those. My paper's sticking together today for some reason. The Laplace transform of e to the a t times f of t is going to be the Laplace transform of f. And then we replace the s by s minus a, which gives us capital F of s minus a. Or we can do this backwards. Um, we can say it this way. The inverse transform of f of s minus a is um, e to the a t times the inverse transform of f of s. 
and the inverse transform of f of s is e to the at. Now, this is not standard notation here. This is just some notation that I made up to make it sort of clear what my intermediate step is. That helps me when I'm doing my work. Um, you don't have to do it this way, but if you use that notation, it'll make it easier for me to grade your work. Um, and if you use this notation, um, I think it, it's clearer that how we're getting from point A to point B. Okay, so let's apply this now. In an example, let's say somebody asks you to compute the Laplace transform of e to the 3t times t times hyperbolic sine of 2t. I definitely do not want to use the definition for this. I'd have to integrate from 0 to infinity. Let's just write it down. We have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times this function, which is e to the 3t times t times hyperbolic sine of 2t. Like, oh, well, maybe I can simplify it a little bit if I write hyperbolic sine of 2t in terms of exponential functions. Maybe that might help. Um, but, but still, it's relatively complicated, and you're going to be there a long time if you were to evaluate all of that by hand. And actually, it really wouldn't be that complicated if you wrote this in terms of exponential functions, and you could just use integration by parts. So, but that's one option. You could do that. You could use the formal definition if you want to. Um, but what I'm recommending is instead of doing this, say, don't do this. Unless you really like integration by parts and you want to practice your improper integrals, then you can. That might be a good way to check your work if you want to and you need a little extra practice on those um, older skills. Um, but we're saying rather than doing this, why don't you do this? Just recognize what f of t is. I don't have this in my table of Laplace transforms. Even when I have the um, table of Laplace transforms from the Zill Differential Equations textbook, which has 58 different Laplace transforms in it, I don't have an exponential times a power of t times a hyperbolic sine function in that table. But I do have t times a hyperbolic sine function in that table. So this could be my f of t, and this could be the e to the at. So rather than doing this, let's do this. And we're just pattern matching. This is my f of t, and this is the e to the at. Well, if that's e to the at, a is equal to 3. And then according to this, what we're going to do is take the Laplace transform of f, which in this case is t times hyperbolic sine of 2t. And then we're going to replace the s with s minus 3. Easy breezy. Now let's go to the table of Laplace transforms and look this up. And also let's look for something like this. I, I don't think we're going to find it. OK, so this is my table from the Zill Differential Equations textbook. It is um, in the front and back cover, I think, or maybe it's just the back cover, of a first course in differential equations with modeling applications. I first started teaching differential equations out of this book years ago, in 2007, I think. Um, but it has 58 transforms in the table. Now, I want a t times hyperbolic sine of 2t or an exponential times t times hyperbolic sine of 2t. So let's look for that in the table. Nothing over here in this first column. Second column. Well, I've got exponentials times hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, and I've got t times hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. But I don't have an exponential times t times hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. So I think what I'll do is I will use this theorem. And again, I, I made this problem up so it wouldn't be in the table. Um, and that means we need the Laplace transform of t times hyperbolic sine of 2t. And then we're just going to replace t or replace s, excuse me, with s minus a, where a is 3. So I'm using this guy right here. Uh, k is equal to 2 in our case. And according to that guy, we get 2 times k times s.
So I'm just going to leave a placeholder for my K. All divided by S squared minus K squared. That quantity squared. And then we're going to replace the S with S minus three because this was multiplied by an e to the 3t. Okay, so this was the form from the table. k was equal to 2, so I'm just going to substitute that in. And then I'll simplify. 2 times 2 is 4, so we have a 4s in the numerator over s squared minus 4, quantity squared. And then this says replace your s with an s minus 3. Oops, there we go. So we have four times S minus three over S minus three squared minus four quantity squared. That is the Laplace transform of e to the three T times T times hyperbolic sine of two T. Not too bad. Now doing it backwards is a little bit harder, but you can kind of see when we might have to use this. If this is what the Laplace transform looks like in the forward direction, if I end up with something that looks like this and I'm going backwards, well, then I might use this as well. So this is what um, the inverse version of the theorem says. It says the inverse Laplace transform of a T, or sorry, I no, I said T, F of S minus A is E to the AT. So you identify A, you put the E to the AT there, and then you use f of s minus a to identify f of s, and you take the inverse Laplace transform of f of s, which gives you f of t. That's going to be over here. And so that's the plan. So if you have something that looks like one of the expressions in your table, it looks like one of those f of s's, but the s's have been replaced by s minus a's, then you know that you're going to have an e to the at times some um, function of t over here. So if you see something like this, or you've got S minus three everywhere, or all the S's seem to have been replaced by S plus twos or something like that, that's when you're going to use this theorem. So let's do an example like that. So here's our example. Let's say somebody gives you F of S equals this. It is 2s minus 1 all divided by s squared plus 6s plus 13. And we want to find f of t, where f of t is the inverse transform of this. Now on the surface, it's not clear that um, using this theorem is appropriate here. But um, I would look at that denominator to figure out you know, what to do next. I don't have any expressions in my table of Laplace transforms that have AS squared plus BS plus C. They always involve um, S squared plus K squared, S squared minus K squared in the denominator, S minus A or S minus B in the denominator. So we always end up with these um, linear factors that are not repeated. And the coefficient of s is always equal to 1, or we have an s squared plus k squared or an s squared minus k squared. So if the expression in the denominator does not look like that, we have to make it look like that. Now let's go to our Laplace transform table and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now focus on the right hand column over here. I've got an s in the denominator, an s squared, s to a different power in the denominator, I've got the square root of s for some of the um, less common ones. You see the s squared plus k squared, s times s squared plus four times k squared. That's a little different. I guess it has to do with the fact that we've got a sine squared or a cosine squared. That's interesting. I bet you could think of why that would have an s squared plus four k squared in it if you remember your trig identities. At s minus a, s squared minus k squared for the hyperbolic cosine and sine. Similar for the uh, hyperbolic sine squared and hyperbolic cosine squared functions. And then you see all of these, they have S minus A's replacing S's. And then if you look at the formulas over here, 16, 17, and 18, you've got T times E to the AT, T to the N times E to the AT, sine of KT times E to the AT, and cosine of KT times E to the KT. So actually 16, 17, 18, and 19 could all be derived using this theorem that we just talked about. 
the Laplace transform of t is 1 over s squared. So if I multiply it by e to the at, it's 1 over s minus a squared. The Laplace transform of t to the n is n factorial over s to the n plus 1. If I multiply that by e to the at, well, the Laplace transform of that is n factorial over s minus a to the n plus 1. And this is this hyperbola, or this is the sine of kt's Laplace transform with s replaced by s minus a. And this is the cosine of kt's Laplace transform with s replaced by s minus a. So we're just using that first shifting theorem. But look at all those denominators. And those are also um, hyperbolic and uh, sine and cosine functions multiplied by e to the at. So you see the a to the um, or the s's have been replaced by s minus a's in the formulas for the hyperbolic sine and cosine of kt, their transforms. But you see the s squared plus k squared quantity squared, s squared minus k squared quantity squared. You end up with these linear factors. Sometimes you have an s squared in the denominator with all those guys. That one's interesting, the s times the, or the sine times the hyperbolic sine, the s to the fourth. But you don't have anything that looks like a s squared plus b s plus c. If it's just a trinomial, like a calculus, or not even a calculus one, like a, a college algebra pre-calculus trinomial, we gotta do a little bit of algebra to make it look like the expressions in the denominator in this table. Well, we're not gonna have any with this square root of s, at least uh, not in this class. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so if you have an expression like the one that we have in our example, like this, you've got to make it look like the ones that they have in their examples or in the table. So you're looking at those columns and you don't have this, this expression here. So we're going to have to do something. So if I see this and I need to take the inverse transform, the first thing I think is, okay, quadratic polynomial, maybe I'm doing partial fraction decomposition. I will do partial fraction decomposition if this factors. Ask myself, are there two numbers that multiply to give me 13 that add to six? No, that's not going to work. Um, on this one, since that does not work, I would recommend completing the square. So we will write it this way. That's my denominator. Now, if I don't have an, a one in front of that s or that s squared, I would divide out that, that one, that, that um, coefficient. So if this was a three, I would factor out a three and then divide out the three from the other two terms so that it was still equivalent. But I need a one in front of the S squared in order to do this. And I just happen to have a one in this case. If there is a one in front of your S squared, the coefficient of S is called B. You wanna take half of that and square it. Three squared is nine. So we're gonna add nine here. That's legal as long as we also subtract nine then this expression will be a perfect square. And then that expression can be simplified. And then all we have done is added and subtracted nine. So we're adding a well-chosen zero here. So the expression that we get when we're done, it is equivalent to this expression. It's just gonna be in that nice form that we want so that we can take the inverse transform. So this is um, S plus three squared. We're looking for two numbers that multiply to give you three that add to six, three and three will work. And then of course, 13 minus nine is four. So that's actually our denominator. So f of s is equal to two s minus one over s plus three squared plus four. Now that looks a lot like an s squared plus four or an s squared plus two squared. That looks like the denominator for the sine or the Laplace transform of the sine of kt or the cosine of kt, but the s has been replaced by s plus three. That's what tells me I want to use this theorem. So we're using the inverse version of the theorem, which says that the Laplace or the inverse Laplace transform of f of s minus a is e to the at times the inverse Laplace transform of f of s. And that inverse Laplace transform of f of s is denoted by f of t. Um, so that's where we're going. That's what we want to do. Um, but we can't apply this directly, not yet, because this doesn't quite look like um, either the sine or cosine function where 
um, S has been replaced by S plus three. So remember the Laplace transform of sine of KT looks like this. It's K over S squared uh, plus K squared. So if I have a constant over S uh, squared plus K squared, I get a sine back if I'm taking the inverse transform. So if I have a constant up here like that negative one, we can always adjust the constant by multiplying by a well-chosen one. Um, but we're going to, if we're replacing the S with S plus three, well then that's gonna involve using this theorem right here. Um, so this negative one over S plus three squared plus four, like that can be handled with this theorem and then this one sort of backwards. But then let's look at the cosine of KT. It's Laplace transform is S over S squared plus K squared. Now, a lot of students are like, oh, well, it's pretty much the same thing. It is, but it's not because this K is just a constant. And this S is actually the variable. That's the transformation parameter. And so when we are replacing S with S plus three here, I need an S plus three in the numerator um, to get a cosine of KT times E to the AT. Um, if I'm taking cosine of uh, KT and I'm multiplying by E to the AT, I would have an S minus A over S minus A squared plus K squared. So this is close, but it doesn't quite look like that. I can't just have an S up here. I need an S plus three up there. So we're gonna do the well-chosen one thing again. Let's factor out the two. I want that to be an S plus three. So I'm just gonna make it an S plus three. My students are like, what? You're just gonna make it an S plus three? Yes, we can do that as long as we compensate for it. So if we're adding three, because that's what we want it to be, we can do that as long as we compensate for adding three by subtracting three. And then we still have that minus one over here. No big deal. And then what I wanna do is I wanna distribute two times that quantity. And then I've got two times that negative three, and then we'll simplify. So we end up with two times S plus three, minus six minus one, so that's minus seven, over S plus three squared plus four. And now if I separate that numerator, so I've got two times S plus three over S plus three squared plus four minus seven over S plus three squared plus four. That's starting to look like these guys where S has been replaced by S plus three. So we're close. By doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation to make this expression that I have match these guys where S is replaced by S plus three, and we're gonna be able to use this theorem over here. Now, again, the key was to see that first I can't factor this. Um, so if I complete the square, I end up here. And then I would, then the key is to say, oh, that looks like S squared plus four, but S has been replaced by S plus three. So we're thinking about that S squared plus K squared, and then we're doing this backwards. Okay, so now we're here. In order to use this one though, we need a K in the numerator when we have a K squared in the denominator. Um, actually, let's, let's just start this process first and then we'll go back to that. So I'm trying to take the inverse transform of something that looks like this. So I'll factor out that two. So this is two times this fraction, s plus three over s plus three squared plus four. And then we're subtracting, I think I'll just do subtracting seven times and I'll just leave a one there for right now. One over s plus three squared plus four. Well, S has clearly been replaced by S plus three. So if I'm matching this to the pattern S minus A, if S minus A equals S plus three, then A must be negative three. So according to this new rule right here, if A is negative three, what we're gonna get is E to the negative three T times the inverse transform of this guy where all the S's have been replaced by, or all the S plus threes, excuse me, have been replaced by S. So you're sort of doing this 
process backwards. So we're gonna have two times s over s squared plus four minus seven times one over s squared plus four. Okay, now I have a rule for that, it's right there. K squared is four, so that means K is two. Here, K squared is four, so K is two. Now this one does not quite look like this yet. If I have a K squared equals four here, so K is two, I need a K in the numerator, so I need a two in the numerator. So I'll just multiply by two, can make it what I want it to be, and that's fine as long as I compensate. So we're gonna do this a lot. We're gonna add what we want as long as we subtract it, that's legal. And then we can make it look the way we want it to look or something similar um, as we've done here. I, I need a two in the numerator so I can multiply and divide by two. It's multiplying by well-chosen one. So adding the well-chosen zero, multiplying by the well-chosen one, that's gonna be something that we do a lot. Okay, so now I've got e to the uh, negative three t times the inverse transform of two times something minus seven over two times something. And I've got an inverse transform for that and I've got an inverse transform for that. So I'm just going to write that down. So I bring the two down and the inverse transform of S over S squared plus K squared is cosine of KT. If K is two, that's gonna be cosine of two T. And then I'll bring my negative seven over two down. And then I've got the inverse transform of two over S squared plus four well, that's sine of 2t. And all of that is multiplied by this e to the negative 3t. So that's our answer. So that is our first translation theorem. I'll see you in the next video where, where we will talk about the heavy side function and um, the second translation theorem.